Hello, fellow gentlemen and gentlewomen. As I was reading Young, I met with some references of Nietzsche's Zarathustra from time to time, so I eventually had to look him up and spend some time with his actual works and not just derivations thereof. So come stay a while and listen as we explore some things regarding one of the most brilliant minds of the 21st century. For verily I say unto thee, Zarathustra doth not speaketh to the man of the past only, Nay, he speaketh to man of all times, indeed unto us all. Readeth him with vigor, and thou shalt have to admit it thyself. <laughs> Sorry, but I do have to admit that listening to him does give you some amount of brain damage. Your grammar will never be the same. I shall try to keep myself to 21st century English for the remainder of this episode, I promise. If the only image you ever had of Nietzsche was similar to that of mine, that is, through the lens of public schools, then you may have heard that he announced God's death, and if your teacher was particularly incompetent, that he is the father of nihilism who hated Christianity and God with a passion, and that his concept of the Übermensch was which gave rise to Nazi Germany. Ironically, Nietzsche was many steps ahead of everyone in his, and apparently our, times, so he even predicted how people will take his views, which he incorporated in his book, so mischaracterizations like this were quite expected by him. He was pretty meta, to be honest. Anyway, his entanglement with Nazi ideology has largely been addressed by many, and you would have to be particularly dense to try to present him as having to do anything with National Socialism, simply due to the fact that he loathed this state more than anything. However, one thing I think is worth investigating is whether Nietzsche actually disliked or hated Christianity or not. It's not at all clear to me, and I shall try to elaborate my views in this episode. So, in the story, there are some events I would like to illuminate as a way to illustrate his views on Christianity, and perhaps show you that he didn't hate Christianity per se. These are as follows. First, the holy man in the woods. Interestingly enough, Zarathustra is a self-proclaimed herald of the death of God. He really does not pass by a chance to tell people that God is indeed dead, this is something that everyone knows, however, for it swept over humanity as a wildfire. When he does meet the holy man in the woods, he realizes that he is quite possibly the last man on earth who has not yet heard of God's death. And he promptly moves on, lest he takes something, that is, his faith, away from him. Thus, he recognizes just how tragic the death of God is and, in a way, would even prefer if it had not been done in the first place. What he does not wish to do, however, is to now try to go back to before he was dead, as it would be similar to trying to crawl back into the womb of your mother or trying to make love to a corpse. He urges us to accept the facts and move on to live instead of descending into nihilism, something he accurately identified would happen. I mean, there's a reason why nihilistic memes today are so popular. 2. His Criticism of Christians Zarathustra is not a fedora tipper, as he does not just go about ranting about how Christians are stupid and should just accept the fact. No, he recognizes that this is a much deeper issue. It is about how the human psyche deals with the loss of such a concept that has been created through millennia, and similarly to how the death of a loved one causes one great psychological trauma, so does the death of God. However, just like you would ill-advise a widow to just kill herself after her husband's death, so too should humanity not descend into madness and consume itself. Now he does make a point about how he wouldn't mind if humanity would actually do that, because that would, in a way, separate the wheat from the chaff and allow for better humans to arise. In other words, it would pave the road for the Superman. Tough love, if you will. And this is precisely the main point I would like to make. Nietzsche is deeply optimistic and embraces life to the fullest. He recognizes that greatness in humanity comes not from the cumulative masses, but rather from the ability of humanity to produce great individuals that surpass the boundaries of what we would think possible. 
summarized in the quote, man is something that should be overcome. Interestingly enough, as a side note, many sci-fis portray this to be the most human characteristic, e.g. the potential for greatness rather than the average human being straight out awesome. These individuals he calls creators. I would like to draw a parallel here between this and Atlas Shrugged, in which Ayn Rand explores a very similar concept, albeit in a less spiritual way than Nietzsche does. She calls these creators producers, and those leeching on them the looters, but the main focus is mostly on their ability to produce material goods. Though Rand is obviously motivated by her deep interest in morality, and she has numerous other works where she focuses on exactly this. And while the protagonists in Atlas served to be an illustration of what humanity should strive to be, that is, larger-than-life heroes, it does come short, I think, in the way that it does not answer at all from whence the values of these heroes come from. Yes, I know, rational self-interest and all that jazz, but I think there's more to that, which is precisely the reason why the portrayal of the producers by the end of Atlas Shrugged becomes more like a cult, with the sign of the dollar being worshipped in a way. Now, maybe Rand's goal was just plain symbolism with this, but it does seem to me awfully like God became a mere material spirit, as in, Instead of worshipping and believing in a god, they just swap out all that for what we might call material advancement. Similarly to how a lot of atheists swap out God's image to the image of the state. Now again, I do think that there is transcendental value in being a producer, like the heroes in Atlas Shrugged, but I think these differences were worth making notes of. Maybe Rand is doing the very thing Zarathustra urged people to do, to try to create a value system, in a way acting out, what the Superman might do. Maybe the zeitgeist shifted so much during that time that Rand was, in her materialistic way, much more spiritual compared to the materialistic people around her. But I digress. Nietzsche's focus on these creators is not merely material, but rather mostly spiritual. Even though he does explain that the soul does not exist, at least not in the sense that one usually thinks about it, as in a distinct entity that exists regardless of the flesh. No, he identifies it as a function of matter, similarly to how I would call it an emergent property of the brain. Therefore, I think his issue with Christians come from when they keep desperately clinging on to dead ideas, ideas that have been proved wrong, and, more importantly, he has a disdain to why they are doing it. He criticizes when they are doing it merely out of peer pressure, hope for reward, or cowardice. And this is worth criticizing even today. I think many Christians in our days, and probably in his as well, fall into the trap of thinking, or rather, preaching sometimes, that weakness is a virtue. By this, I mean that many think that, for example, murder, that is, by their terms, causing the willful death of another human, is always wrong. Yes, that does include self-defense, which they refer to as sinful. Now there is actually a proper terminus technicus for these people, Christ cucks. These people think that lying down to die is better than standing up for their values, that by bending over backwards to every threat and aggression, they do God's will. Ironically, they tend to forget that, to the colloquial question of what would Jesus do, grabbing a whip and beating people till they leave is a valid option. Now, these people choose this path, not because it is the virtuous, but because by doing so, they pose their own weakness, that is, their cowardice, as a strength, as if it would be so hard to just shut up and roll over when push comes to shove. Here I think we can, or rather should, all agree with Nietzsche, who essentially says something along the lines of, that dog which has no teeth cannot be a good dog just because he cannot bite. He mostly refers to this as your paws having claws, but you get the gist. 
Another thing I agree with wholeheartedly is that it is particularly ugly if the only reason why you were doing good things and omitting evil acts was your fear of punishment, that is, an eternity of hell. Something which Zarathustra explains was thought up to much delight of God's followers, which is surely the case. However, if you would be out on the street looting, raping and eating each other, if someone would take the concept of hell away from you, you need to do some serious fucking introspection because that is just not kosher. Exhibit 3. The Pope In case you aren't yet convinced that Nietzsche actually does not hate Christianity, consider Zarathustra's meeting with the last pope. Curiously enough, Zarathustra speaks in the highest regards to and about him, and this holds true throughout the book. See, it just makes no sense to me that someone who is supposed to hate Christianity and Christians would paint such a positive picture of this figure. No, I think one has to understand that there are layers to what Nietzsche is talking about. No one is capable to actually describe his views fully and without errors, simply through language. Thus, in order to fully understand a person's concepts and ideas, he has to give different viewpoints, episodes, snapshots on certain things, and hope you will be able to piece together your bearings and understand where he stands. Kind of like triangulating base stations in order to pinpoint the location of a cell phone. One has to fill in certain blanks that the source is not able to fully communicate, and has to connect certain dots and see where they meet. Now, the source might not be able to fully communicate the points due to language barriers, e.g. words not yet existing, or difference in language proficiency, differences in perceived meanings of words, etc. Or due to personal shortcomings, like not realizing exactly one's own position, e.g. why one is arguing for something, or what the argument really is about especially when feelings are thrown into the mix as well, or perhaps simply due to plain old communication errors, like mishearing or missaying something. Either way, the result is the same. One fails to fully make himself understood. Even worse, I find sometimes that speaking more about a subject makes things even worse, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> In either case, I think I have made a clear point that Zarathustra thinks the Pope is a pretty cool guy. Alright, those were the things I found particularly striking about Thus Spake Zarathustra, but I'm sure you could find more if you were to thoroughly read the book yourself, which I would suggest you do because it is a surprisingly interesting read. Links will be in the description. One more thing. As I was in the process of tackling this episode, I had some talks with a Jesuit, and he elaborated how he has found that, yes, people's view on God and the Church have changed, but that does not imply the quote-unquote death of God. He said most people who come to them to get married, get christened, or have their child christened, etc., they don't just want a ceremony or do it due to peer pressure or whatever. No, they do it because of something much more profound. Keep in mind that not all parties are, strictly speaking, religious people in these situations. The husband or the wife might come with a secular background. And even if or when they are somewhat religious, it's not that they fear that their child would go to hell if it were to die tragically before it is christened, or that they fear that their cohabitation would be sinful, or would make them feel guilty if they would not marry, both of these examples being something that Nietzsche heavily criticized, and rightly so. It is rather in the hope of something akin to a divine goodwill, or blessing, well, Something transcendental, anyway, for a lack of a better word, though I do think my usage of it starts to border on abuse. So, maybe Nietzsche was right in the sense that God, in his classical sense, did die. But as he had said himself, gods can die many kinds of deaths, and may suffer many kinds of rebirth. Maybe faith in faith itself is a better way to put today's religiousness. <laughs> maybe there is nothing wrong about that. Speaking of rebirths, Jung has an excellent chapter about it. Check it out if you haven't already, it will be in the description below as well. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Misunderstanding Jung, even if it wasn't strictly speaking about Jung, but rather Nietzsche. Man, I could ramble on and on about this still, 
but I think further length would not really help anyone listening. Perhaps this will suffice to plant the seed of an idea anyway. Still, if you would like to see, or rather hear more content like this, smash the subscribe button. Also, I am on Twitter now, and you can find me under Kane underscore must. Holler at me, will ya? It's quite lonely as of now. Cheers, people.